Hello everyone and welcome back to Who's Corner. I'm your host Mr. D and this is episode 1, Storm Warning, starring Paul McGann as the Doctor and India Fisher as Charlotte Pollard. Tardis Manual, Tardis Manual, Tardis Manual. Not here, are you? I really must work through these shells properly some centuries soon. Oh, Agatha Christie, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, first printing signed with the last page missing. Oh, never, never done it. So we begin Storm Warning with the Doctor going through his library trying to find the Tardis Manual. He is in the vortex, and he comes across several tomes, if you will, several novels, one being The Wizard of Oz, uh, The I Spy Book of British Birds, He Finds War and Peace, and a book from Agatha Christie, uh, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, if I am correct, and as he's going through it, he finds the last page missing. Significance? Maybe. An emergency stop signal kind of gets the doctor out of the library to look outside of the TARDIS to find a time ship that is stuck in a type of glitch, which is going up and down, crashing, reappearing, crashing, reappearing. It is completely swarmed with vortisaurs, and vortisaurs are these flying dinosaurs that live in the vortex. They love time anomalies. So as the doctor has a plan to, he has a plan to get the TARDIS to ram into this ship, knocking it off the loop so that it can crash and be at peace. If there is any survivors on board, more than likely they have long since uh, decayed away, depending how long this ship has been in the vortex. So as he's preparing the TARDIS to ram the ship, all the Vortisaurs start attacking him. Now, as we all know, the TARDIS is heavily protected by defenses that, you know, we couldn't possibly fathom. But each of these Vortisaurs are starting to damage the outside shields and start to damage the hull. And as he does manage to knock the ship out of the glitch, he starts to go down with it. And as he de dematerializes, he kind of is worried that he's going to take himself out along with the other Vortisaurs. Empire News, Masters of the Air. Crowds gather at RF Coddington Bedminster to cheer on the latest addition to Great Britain's Skyfleet, the airship R101. As she prepares to take to the clouds on her maiden voyage, she is a hefty lady of that there can be no doubt. 130 feet high, one-seventh of a mile long bow to stern, suspended by five and a half million cubic feet of hydrogen gas. This mighty dirigible is bigger than any vessel selling the world's oceans, let alone the sky. Truly, a new wonder of the modern world. Joining her 46-strong crew for this first voyage to the far-flung shores of India, six very important passengers, including the Minister for the Air, Brigadier General, the Right Honorable Lord Tamsworth, whose dream of an imperial airship service making to the furthest of Britain's dominions has at last become reality. Ladies and gentlemen, today marks the beginning of a new age in intercontinental travel. I am delighted and proud to be accompanying the worthy crew of this magnificent vessel on her inaugural flight. And I shall see you all in Karachi. After Tamworth's speech and the R101 is safely in the clouds, we are introduced to Technical Director Frayling, who voices some concern over the modifications that Tamworth has made to his ship, and also about the mysterious passenger in Cabin 43 who does not appear up on any roster. Tamworth, of course, brushes him off and just tells him to go mingle with the crowd, help his career, as one may say. After Frayling departs, Peter Rathbone shows up, and Tamworth kind of asks him to keep an eye on Cabin 43, just in case someone goes snooping around. Now, who is Peter Rathbone? He is a type of enigmatic figure. We believe he is a an agent of the British Empire. He is South African. We will find that out. And also, in in later CDs, we do hear... Charlie does say that he was South African, though she does not say his name. At the same time, we have the Doctor waking up in the TARDIS, still in the vortex, but he has managed to survive and push the ship 
out of the glitch and it has crashed and everything seems okay. So as he's trying to depart from the vortex, he is being trailed by a lone vortosaur. And as he says goodbye and uh, dematerializes, he accidentally scoops up this flying dinosaur with him. Memoirs of an Edwardian Adventuress by Charlotte E. Pollard Chapter 1 Candy floss clouds scattered as the mighty dirigible soared into the black night sky. A black so black it... Well, what is that supposed to mean? A black so black it blotted out all but the brightest of stars. I watched as the full moon shimmered into view, casting silver rays about the cabin when... Yes, this is Charlotte E. Pollard. She will become the Doctor's very first companion within the audio series. And she is rudely interrupted by Chief Week Stewart, who is under the impression he is banging on the door of a Simon Merchford, who is supposed to be one of the stewards aboard the plane. So as Charlie has to get dressed, tuck her hair under a cap, and put on all her her uniform, if you will, and try to keep her identity a secret, she meets Stuart Weeks and they are heading off to uh, serve drinks at the VIP lounge. The doctor materializes into one of the ballast tanks of the R-101, and as he's looking around, he tells himself he has two options. He can get back in the TARDIS and hastily dematerialize, or he can head up a ladder and find out where he is. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a silver dollar, gives it a, a flick, and decides to go exploring. So, where am I? Now, why is it I am reminded of Jonah and the belly of the whale? It's like a giant ribcage stuffed with obscene, pulsating organs as far as the eye can see. After that speech, it clicks to the doctor that he is in some kind of airship, he does smell gas, it's a very faint smell, and as he turns, the hatchway closes behind him. The reason it does that is because Frayling goes to Tamworth and wonders why the airship is sudden, suddenly listing. And of course, Tamworth is like, maybe you've got just too much water in the ballast tank, and Frayling goes to check, and it's true. So he empties the remaining water that's in that ballast tank, dumping the TARDIS, and thus stranding the doctor aboard the R-101. As Tamworth is relaxing once Frayling has left, he calls over Simon Merchford, or Charlie, to serve him some cognac. Unfortunately, a bit of turbulence knocks Charlie on Tamworth, spilling the drink all over him, but her cap gets skewered, so her, some of her hair starts falling out. She also forgets to use her male voice and uses her own by accident. Once she's found out, though, she's completely unabashed by it, saying that she did it for the thrill and that your Simon Merchford is probably still lying dead drunk at the stables of the Heron Hound. She takes off running with Chief Steward Weeks after her. As Charlie is escaping, the doctor is through the, going through the cabins right now. He does hear some type of moaning come from cabin 43. He pulls out a stethoscope and starts listening in. He can hear two individuals, one kind of just completely scared to death of something. He, it's, it's moaning loudly. The other one's basically telling him, telling it to just shut up. It's just it's a tiny needle, you know, and the doctor's getting kind of concerned until he sees something that catches his eye that just puts Cabin 43 out of his mind. Charlie runs into him, and he's more of like... You know, mistaking her how instead of a how, like the Native American way of, of, of greeting. And she's more, you know, trying to get away from someone that he can see in her eye that someone is chasing her. So they hide, and Chief Steward Weeks, you know, looks about just for maybe a second or two before giving up, saying that, you know, you're, you're really no skin off my rosy red nose. And then Charlie's like, yeah, well... It's redder than Lennon's pajamas. And the doctor's like, no, they were sort of mauve the last time I, I uh, met him. He was terrible at tiddlywinks. And she's, Charlie's just staring at this man. And he's like, yeah, like now the Tsarina, there was a Alexandria. She was, there was a woman who knew how to play some games. And she laughs at him, you know, saying that he was probably one of the oddest me man that she's ever met. So Charlie introduces herself to the doctor and the doctor to her. 
and they start making very light pleasantries, like where are they, where she's headed, and she tells him that that the ship is heading to Karachi, and the doctor kind of takes interest in that. He does ask if this airship, you know, once everything starts clicking into place in, place in his mind, that is this ship the uh, R one hundred one, and she of course says yes, and he asks, is the year nineteen thirty in October? And she nods. And of course, though, now he realizes that something is very wrong. Hmm. You're not supposed to be here, are you, Charlie? Doctor, you know that already. No, no, no. I mean, you are really not supposed to be here, are you? No, I'm not. Oh, come on, Doctor. What's the matter? It's just as I say. If I remember my Earth history correctly, the R-101 airship took to the sky for her maiden voyage to India early in October of 1930, yes, and, and crashed in flames in France during a storm in the early hours of the next morning, killing everyone on board. And you're saying that's what's going to happen to us? Yes, Charlie. I'm very much afraid I am. Of course, Charlie doesn't believe him. She's just kind of like, you know, she's interested in this man, but she just wants him to tell the truth. And of course, the doctor assures her that he is. But at that same time, we have in Cabin 43, the uh, mysterious passenger still going a little crazy from fear. And Rathbone is just kind of, you know, kind of threatening him that he's going to give him something that'll really make him cry until he hears something scraping right outside the the window and as he peers out a head comes through one of the the vortisaur that escaped through the vortex latches on to rathbone's arm and starts just, just tearing it to shreds and as he's trying to fight off this this creature he hears the door knock and it's chief steward weeks asking him you know he's got the coffee is everything all right and of course rob Moon is tr struggling with this this bird and at that same time the doctor and charlie appear because they hear the screams and they both uh help uh steward weeks uh break the door down and they see this bird is just completely destroying Rathbone's arm. So the doctor goes over, takes the pot of coffee, and douses the creature with it. Now, it doesn't hurt it. It actually hurts Rathbone more. But the bird doesn't feel the heat. It actually just doesn't like the flavor. So it let go. So it lets go, and it starts flying around the ship. Now, this concerns the doctor because he can't just have this vortisaur flying around and, like, scraping up against the side of the ship. It'll just, it's going to rip holes in it. So as Rathbone is uh, cradling his arm, he notices that Charlie is going to examine the mysterious passenger. Now, this passenger is actually wearing a deep sea diving suit, and it's got all these hooks and as well these uh, these these wires hooked up to it. And as she's trying to talk to him or to it, Rothman pulls out a gun. And of course, the doctor's like, you know, that's not really a good idea when we're on an airship. And especially with you with a damaged arm. So Rathbone's basically like, you know, why don't you go and take care of that creature and then we'll talk. So he, so the doctor takes Chief Stuart Weeks to the other cabin next door, breaks the window, and the doctor uses... Uh, a shard of glass to cut his own hand so it'll lure the uh, Vortisaur near them because it's Time Lord blood so it's going to be attracted to it more and as the Vortisaur is coming down the doctor kind of pulls the head in so that Weeks can use some of the morphine that was in cabin 43 for the passenger to knock it out and they just lock the creature up in I guess you could say it was cabin 44 or 42 so once the Vortisaur is safely locked up in one of the other cabins, the Doctor returns to examine the mysterious passenger. But of course, Rathbone is not having anything to do with that. And so Chief Stewart is like, well, the head of uh, the airship is the one you probably need to talk to about this, Lord Tamworth. So the Doctor's like, well, we'll lead on. But of course, Rathbone's like, no, why don't you leave the girl here with me? And you go see the uh, the captain. And of course, though, the doctor knows that Charlie can probably handle herself in a situation, but is still kind of edgy about leaving her with this crazy man. Lord Tamworth. Yes, sir. 
And you are the doctor of most things and some more besides before you ask. Of most things and some more besides. Steward, what do you mean by bringing some long-haired stowaway into the VIP lounge? I'm wearing a tie. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. There was this monster, you see, and he attacked Mr. Rothbone. And then he turned up, and then we caught it and locked it in the galley. Monster! Don't interject, Frayling. Steward, is this man armed? Uh, no, sir. Is he dangerous? Uh, I don't think so, sir. And is he insane? I uh, would like to say so, sir. Hmm. Well, two out of three is not bad. Dismissed, Chief Steward. Now, naturally, Tamworth is not going to let his guard down for the second stowaway that's on his ship. So he asks the doctor, you know, are you some kind of spy? And the doctor kind of replies, well, what would you do if I said I was? And Tamworth is like, well, why didn't you tell us? He becomes absolutely delighted and thinking that the Doctor and Charlie are spies, and not just some ordinary spies, he thinks that they're German spies. He even mentions, you know, do you work for Eckhart, you know, for the Zeppelin company? I, I knew that he could not resist, you know, coming to uh, investigate us, because we've he, he must think that we're so advanced. And he does mention the Hindenburg, which is, is, is really nice to hear another piece of history. And he's just so delighted to hear that. But he does tell the doctor, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but once we get to the ground, I'm going to have to have you arrested and probably you're going to be executed. And the doctor just kind of brushes it aside like, uh, you know, it's, it, it comes with becoming a spy for the German Empire and everything. And he goes by the name Dr. Johann Schmidt and his, and his friend Fräulein Pollard. But, after they talk a little bit about, you know, the aviation part, the doctor does inquire about cabin 43 and its passenger. Now, Tamworth isn't going to give anything away at this point, but the doctor does point out that the passenger is not well, and he would like to, you know, kind of give him a checkup. And Tamworth's like, well, I don't see any harm in that, because you're going to be dead by the time we reach the ground, so why not? So he leads the doctor back to cabin 43, where Charlie is still keeping her distance from Rathbone, but she's still concerned about the passenger. So as the doctor comes in with Tamworth, Tamworth gives the okay for the, the diving helmet to be removed. And as it is being removed, we are given a very brief... Um, very brief, how do I say this, features for this alien. And the way that I have pictured it in my head is more like how they describe the Roswell aliens. Very big, bulbous heads, dark, very black eyes, long necks, very thin bodies, gray. Though Charlie does kind of say white a little bit, but it could be like a cream, almost very uh, shifting from white to, to grayish and everything. Very traditional alien-like. And this is our introduction to the Triskeli. And as the doctor's looking over, he notices the passenger's getting better. And the reason is, is that the airship is climbing. It's actually ascending further up. And what happens is that once Charlie is introduced to this alien, an alarm goes off, and Tamworth's like, all right, well, our rendezvous is ready. And now they have to wield this Triskeli out to meet all the crew and basically get ready to meet the other Triskeli that are now descending the clouds to uh, absorb the R-101 into its ship. There's something above us. It's huge. It's like daylight outside. We are arrived. What is it? I suppose you might call it a flying saucer. As the ship is being uh, guided into the Triskeli ship, the doctor asked Charlie, what is it that she wanted to do once she reached Karachi? And... She gives a very interesting speech to the doctor that goes like this. You've been there, haven't you? You've really been there. Like you really have met Geronimo and Lennon. 
Just think the furthest place I could imagine was the terrace of the Singapore Hilton. The Singapore Hilton? I met a Venusian there. Oh, we'll do after your time. Why the Singapore Hilton? Long story. No, not really. There's this boy. Well, man. I met not too long ago. A trader. Works all over the world. Mostly in the Far East. Said you haven't lived since you've had a gin sling on the terrace of the Singapore Hilton while the sun goes down. I made him promise to meet me there on New Year's Eve. He just laughed. So I thought, stuff you! Come hella high water, it's a date! So that's why you smuggled yourself aboard the R-101. Karachi to Singapore. That's no distance at all. Once inside the Triskeli's flying saucer, they are moored upon a tower that is an exact copy of the one that's in Cardington. And the doctor's fascinated by this. They, this area is enormous. And the mooring uh, and the stairway that goes down just keeps going and going. So the doctor, you know, tries to get to ask the Triskeli, you know, what, you know, where are we going to go from here? And the Triskeli's like, well, my name is Engineer Prime, and there are only going to be three delegates to Tamworth's very annoyance. He was expecting a whole grand uh, entourage to impress these aliens and take them over. But Engineer Prime is like, no, there's only going to be three of you to meet everyone else. One will be Technical Director Frailing, Tamworth, as he call as they call him Tamworth Lord, and the Doctor. Now, of course, Tamworth is like really pissed off about this, but he's not going to do anything to jeopardize the mission. So he tells Chief Stuart Wicks to be in charge, and he also tells Rathbone to keep an eye on everything, kind of forgetting that Rathbone has orders of his own in case things go sour. And the Doctor does not want to leave Charlie alone, but having another stable human being on the ship kind of gives him a little more of a solace. So, with Frailing, the Doctor, Tamworth, and Engineer Prime, they set off. And the Doctor asks, well, how did you two meet? How did you and Tamworth end up here? And Tam was like, well, that's an interesting story because I got a call that there was this craft that crashed. And by the time I got there, the entire spaceship was just disintegrating, going into the ether. The only thing left was this individual. And naturally, he couldn't speak any of our languages. So we just took him in. And he remarks that over the course of weeks, the interrogations got more severe. He does apologize for it. And Engineer Prime is like, you know, I is basically saying I don't hold a grudge. I get why you did it. So, as Tamworth is continuing with his story, he gets a knock on the door, and it's Peter Rathbone and a bunch of men. And he tells him, you know, he knows of this woman that can help him. So they go to see this woman, Madame Zelda, who is a spiritual medium. And of course, Frailing's like, what? But as he continues, so we put the Triskeli in front of Madame Zelda, and they just stare at each other for 48 hours, not saying a word, until, after 48 hours, Engineer Prime is ready to talk. And that's how they came to be here. And of course, the doctor's like, well, that's a very nice somewhat nice uh, way of, of putting it, but why would you interrogate this individual and learn it, have it uh, speak just to take it home? It doesn't make any sense. And Tamworth's like, well, you know, we had other means of, of doing this too, which of course, when we get back to the airship, we see Rathbone taking out all these crates filled with guns. Now, as Engineer Prime is leading them through the ship, they step on this kind of big insignia, which is described as three hooks joined to the middle. And the Doctor goes on one portion, Tamworth goes on the other, and Frailing is next to Engineer Prime. And they move through the ship, so they are basically... Go, uh, the decks are turning with the ship, is, is how it's described. And the first deck they get to is with all the other engineers. 
And the doctor's fascinated by this because these are the intellects. These are the ones that are the builders, the thinkers. And Frayling's interested too. And, and of course, the Engineer Prime likes Frayling as we will get to, to why. So as they move to another deck, it gets dark. Whereas where the engineers were, it was warm and peaceful and bright. But when they get to the second layer, they meet the uncreators. Now, the uncreators are still the Triskeli, but they are more monstrous. And they are all chained up in this... Almost want to, You want to think that it's like a chaotic chasm, if you will. Almost like hell, but it's, it's still part of the ship. And Tamworth is introduced to Uncreator Prime who asks Tamworth about his his dealings with war and, and his services and asks if there was lots of glory at, at, at a battle called Jericho. And, of course, Tamworth is, you know, yes, he's an old soldier, but he's an old soldier that is not bloodthirsty. He's like, well, there was many medals and citations and handshakes, but no, there was no glory. And... As the doctor, you know, is examining the uncreators, he's like, "How did it come to this?" And it come, it it, it, it is that the Triskeli were once whole. They were one being. They were both the engineers and the uncreators, and we'll get to the third part in a second. But something happened that they basically almost wiped themselves out until a handful was left and out of that they decided to create a law a law if you will that keeps them all together now as tamworth is you know listening to this and hearing all these atrocities that the triskeli have done you know he he feels sorry for them and we have uncreator prime really getting angry about this i'm beginning to understand We've seen the brains of the Triskeli already. These uncreators, they're the dark heart of the Triskeli. Unacted desires, the urge to destroy, to kill, to uncreate. What have the Triskeli done to themselves? And why? We are chained by the law, suppressed. The engineers fear us. Fear what the Triskeli once were, what they could be again. Tamworth, you pity we uncreators? Old soldiers, saw enough young men return from the front, bits blown off them, boys' faces paralyzed by mustard gas, frozen in the horror of the moment, frozen forever. War to end all wars, never again. Pity, sorrow, sadness. You stand in my place on the Triskelin, but you have renounced your heritage. You are not an uncreator. Engineer Prime, you have cheated me. No, no. You have cheated me out of my thrall. Open your mind to me, Engineer Prime. Open it. I feel the dread in you. There is uncreation on Earth. There is a name. A harshness, wrath, wrathbone. Where is wrathbone? After that little speech, we are taken to, back to the ship where wrathbone is kind of, you know, just kind of frozen for a second. You hear the uncreator laughing, almost like it's behind him. And he asks who's there. And you can still hear the laughing until Charlie interrupts it, asking him if he's okay. And of course, Rothbone's like, you know, of course I'm fine. And he's, you know, counting down the time. He's like, I'm giving him 10 more minutes and then we move out. The final deck on the ship is the third part of the Triskeli. And as the doctor remarks, think about it. You have intellect, which are the engineers. You have the instinct which are the uncreators but as a human bo as a body what is missing how does it how do you know what you're doing is right or wrong it's because we have conscience we can choose and as they move through they come to a complete void 
There's nothing there. And the doctor's kind of thinking, you know, maybe there'd be a bunch of these conscience Triskeli around, but there isn't. There's only one, the lawgiver. And as the doctor finally understands why that the Triskeli came to Earth and why they selected three individuals is because the lawgiver is dying. And as Engineer Prime is like, yes, doctor, you are correct. And we, part of the engineers, nominate you to be our new lawgiver. And of, of course, though, Tamworth is not having any of that whatsoever. Yes, Doctor the, we seek another to lead us. Doctor the, the engineers, we nominate you. No, 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 this won't do at all. Uh, lawgiver, this man, the, the Doctor, he's not all he claims to be. We know, Tamworth Lord. We seek an Earthman. The Doctor is not. Not human. Ah, yes, I was meaning to have a word with you about that. So now comes the problem. Engineer Prime has failed twice. He was supposed to bring an engineer, which he did. He favored Frailing. He was supposed to bring uh, an uncreator, but he brought Tamworth, who is an old soldier, who more of despises bloodshed and war, and that angers him. And, of course, he brought a Time Lord to become the Lawgiver. Now, did Engineer Prime know this about the Doctor? Probably not. The Lawgiver is a lot, is a lot more in-depth to knowledge, deeper knowledge of the cosmos than probably the Engineers or the Uncreators are. But it comes also down to the fact that the Doctor would not take that position anyway, because he's not going to just become a, a, a supreme commander to any race of creatures. But there comes a bigger problem that Tamworth suddenly realizes. He has left the airship too long, and Rathbone is already rallying the troops. And at the ship, we see Charlie trying to stop Rathbone, even though there's a gun pointed at her. And as all these crewmen are exiting the ship, going down the mooring staircase, and her, well, Chief Stewart's orders are to keep an eye on her, and if she moves, to shoot her. And as he departs, when Rathbone and his uh, soldiers reach the bottom of the Morn's case, of the Morn staircase, they are confronted by the Triskeli Primes and the Doctor Frailing and Tamworth. Now Tamworth tries to plead with Rathbone to stop what they are doing. The the entire plan, the mission has failed, and that they are not putting any harm towards these aliens. And of course Rathbone has no interest whatsoever. He wants the power of this ship, and he pushes Tamworth to the ground, points the gun at Uncreator Prime, but of course Un Uncreator Prime is absolutely loving this, even though he is being threatened. And Rathbone is telling him to surrender, but Uncreator Prime is like, I am not the leader, I cannot, you know, surrender to anybody. That goes to the lawgiver, and then the gun is pointed at the lawgiver. And as the doctor is is telling Rathbone to stop, and the lawgiver is just kind of berating Rathbone, saying that he is even worse than he could have imagined, Rathbone pulls the trigger and kills him. And that completely sets off this chain reaction of the engineers completely going into hiding, and all the uncreators that were chained are now free to rule as they wish without any law and of course, Engineer uh, uh, Uncreator Prime releases his hold onto Rathbone, and Rathbone just completely just blacks out. He can't he can't control this. And Chief Stuart Weeks sees all the Uncreators coming out of the shadows, and they start firing upon them, even though they have no idea what these creatures are. And the Doctor tries to get some type of order. He he gets Tamworth back up, even as the 
uncreators are ga- uh, are closing in, and Tamworth just just snaps. He barks at these creatures to back off, and they do. And the doctor's like, they're terrified of you. And he he starts telling all the men, Charlie, Frailing, Tamworth, to start to start yelling, to start roaring at them, you know, because they've never seen another predator before. Let them have it. Just scream as loud as you can. Let them be afraid of you. And so they all start doing it. And forgive me for saying this, but I would say to Frailing and be like, you know, be be like a Growlithe outside of Lavender Town in the tall grass and just roar. Make it difficult for yourself to get to be captured. <laughs> Geek moment. And as they all roar, all of the Uncreators go back into hiding except for Uncreator Prime. Now, Uncreator Prime is not taken aback by any of this. He tries to rally his troops, but he is left alone. So what does he do? He pulls out his insignia, the Draskelin, and it turns into an energy weapon. And at that, Tamworth has had enough. He's like, you know, why don't you just fight me man to man? And Uncreator Prime takes the first hit and really hurts Tamworth. And he just starts to, you know, monologue to himself after one hit. Tamworth comes back and starts laying in a bunch of punches to the point that he actually does beat uh, Uncreator Prime. So Uncreator Prime has one option. He gets Wrathbone back into conscience and he starts commanding him, possessing him to pick up that gun and to shoot Tamworth. And as Rathbone is fighting it and fighting it, it it just boils over and he finally points the gun away from Tamworth and shoots Uncreator Prime, killing him. So thus, the Triskeli have lost two leaders. They've lost their Lawgiver and they've lost their Uncreator Prime. Now comes the, the part that Tamworth has to decide. If this was his fault. So what is he going to do? He's going to take over and be a facilitator for the Triskeli. I should go back, you know. I should return to Coddington in this glorious machine. They said I could ask for anything I liked if I brought the aliens in. Viceroy of India, that's what I wanted. But look at what we've done here today. There are so many Wrathbones back home, Doctor. So many more. And the Triskeli deserve better. Better than being dragged into our human affairs. If you leave now, you can never return. I know, Doctor. I know. Triskeli! You hear me. There is no more lawgiver. There is no more law. If I stay, I can offer my advice. My help. I'm an old man. I can't stay long. You must learn to find your own way. In time. Then... That is enough, Mr. Tamworth. And with that, the Drusceli start to uh, get ready to depart. And Tamworth has one last thing to, to ask the doctor, to make sure that the R101 reaches its destination. And of course, the doctor, he says he'll do what he can. So as the R101 is released back into the skies and the Triskeli ship vanishes into the night. There is celebration, but also a storm is brewing that no one seems to notice. Technical Director Frailing is now parting it up with everyone, completely unaware of what's going on around him. And of course, Rathbone is there too, just drinking and having fun with everybody else, even though he kind of caused a little bit of a war. The Doctor, though is trying to plead with Frailing to, to to stop what he's doing, to just land the ship before it's too late. He can't tell them why, but he's trying to persuade him to give up going to Karachi to at least land or go back. And Frailing's not having any part of it. They are going to re- arrive at Karachi in, in glory because they have secured a piece of technology that will help the British Empire, and Rathbone shows it off. It is the Uncreator Prime's energy weapon. Now, the Doctor is just stunned 
he, he just he, it's just still baffles to it just ba- bobble, uh, baffles his imagination that human beings can be this selfish that they will do absolutely everything they can to destroy one another just like the Triskeli did. So what does he do? He takes the energy weapon away from Rathbone and just takes Charlie and runs. Where do they go on this airship? Well, it's not really known to what the Doctor's thinking, but he knows he's got to get this weapon out of the hands of human beings. Rathbone takes flight after them and corners them within the chamber with all the gas bags that the Doctor first arrived in. Now, Frailing is also in trouble because... All, the ship is taking heavy damage during this storm, and he can't control it. And with the Doctor and Charlie being pursued by this crazy individual with an axe now, the Doctor knows he can't use the energy weapon because he doesn't use guns. And of course, though, Rathbone knows he can't use the energy weapon because it would cause the ship to explode. So what does the Doctor do? He throws the weapon at Rathbone. And Rathbone acts, just he, he drops it. And as he's dropping it, the the uh, bridge that he's on starts to fall apart, and the hull opens, sucking Rothbone and the Triskeli's weapon into the blackness of the night, and he's gone forever. So as the Doctor and Charlie are just waiting for their inevitable death, they hear this screeching in the background, and the Vortisaur that they had locked up had awakened and escaped. So the Doctor kind of uses a cut on his hand to lure the Vortisaur down so they can get on it and fly away. And of course, though, he does remark, and he does say this earlier in the in the uh, drama, that he used to ride these creatures bareback at the Academy, probably with the Master, who knows. And sadly, though, as Frailing sees his doom, he takes one last swig of champagne before going into flames. And as Charlie watches... The R101 just completely disintegrate into the early morning uh, dawn, if you will. You know, she and the Doctor have a bit of a a, a push as as the Vortisaur, once they land, starts to become afraid of them. And the Doctor's like, no, wait a minute, it's, it's not me he's afraid of, it's afraid of you, Charlie. And Charlie's like, you know, she kind of likes this bird, so she knows she's going after it, not knowing that this bird is dangerous. But she keeps t- she keeps asking, I haven't done anything to you. But the doctor has a little speech that <laughs> kind of gives him pause for a sec. It wasn't anything you've done, Charlie. It's what you are, isn't it? Very sensitive, Vortisaurs. They know when something's up with time, and something's very definitely up today, isn't it? Oh, stupid, stupid, stupid time, Lord, what have you done? Think, think, think. Fifty-four people set off in the R101 yesterday, so that's fifty-four bodies should be accounted for here. Here, in this twisted skeleton spread out over the hillside. But there's no time more, so at least fifty-three. But there should be one more. Charlie. You. Oh, Doctor, haven't you learned anything? She should have died. She's cheated history, broken strands in the web of history of time, and all because you were here interfering, intervening. What was it they used to say at the Academy about the beat of a butterfly's wings and the Matrula causing a time store in the moor to spiral? Might as well have let Rathbone bring down the Triskelin. Oh, Charlie... If you survive in the crash has changed the future, then it's my duty as a Time Lord to change it back. Put you back in the airship just after two in the morning on this terrible day in October and leave you to... <sighs> but of course the Doctor's not going to do that. As he sees Charlie finally get ran- uh, the Vortisaur to come back, you know, and is more of easy around her. You know, she kind of remarks that, well, you know, this wasn't so difficult. And the doctor at this point is not going to just go back in time and dump her back on a, on a destroy, on a dying airship. But of course, though, he hasn't, he can't just, you know, always have her because the Time Lords are going to figure this out if they haven't already. But he knows that that will be another story for another time. So as they get on the back of this Vortisaur, Charlie's like, well, what are we going to call him? You know, let's, let's give him a name. So she decides to call him after the Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. 
and Ramsey will stay on with the uh, the Doctor for a couple of episodes before he gets thrown back into the vortex. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you've enjoyed this review of Doctor Who's um, audio drama Storm Warning by Alan Barnes. Like I said, the Doctor was played by uh, Paul McGann, and Charlie was played by India Fisher. This one is readily available on Amazon or eBay, well-priced, $13, probably $14. I will be coming back with you with another episode. Um, episode 2 will be uh, Sword of Orion, which is one of my favorites out of the early bunch of the audio dramas. So I hope you enjoy, and I will see you next time.